The God of Death has been meditating. And as a result, there's been a big explosion in the human population. And for some reason, this has frightened the gods, so they appeal to Vishnu. And it's Vishnu's job to cull the human population. In order to do this, he sets up a huge battle and incarnates as Krishna. And we're also told that Arjuna is part of this incarnation. We're told that Lord Vishnu incarnates as Lord Krishna along with his alter ego named Arjuna. So that's quite interesting. We're on the battlefield as outlined in the Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna, the Lord, continues to instruct Arjuna. Arjuna's having a crisis of conscience. He doesn't want to kill his relatives who are on the other side of the battle line. Arjuna, you are not the killer. Give up this vain egotistic notion. You are the self which is devoid of old age and death. He who is free from ego sense and whose intelligence is not attached to anything, he does not kill, nor is he bound, even if he destroys the whole world. What we have here seems to be a charter for the psychotically deranged. The psychotically deranged perform the most atrocious acts of murder, torture and mayhem. And they feel it was not them that was the doer. Maybe even God told them. So we need to be careful about this. The, the yoga physician often has settings of an extreme nature, usually settings involving bereavement or the aftermath of some awful war, the traumatic aftermath of a shocking war. And here it's presenting us with rather a shocking scenario. The teachings of self-inquiry are being used to promote killing and violence. It's not something we should be a party to. But what we're going to have to do here is follow the examples already set and try and apply the teaching of self-inquiry even in the midst of this outrage. So he does not kill, nor is he bound, even if he destroys the whole world. You can almost imagine the supervillain scenario. The Hindu nuclear scientist has stockpiled a massive, a massive arsenal of nuclear weapons. But he's enlightened. And to prove he's enlightened, he's going to kill the whole world without any remorse because he's not the doer. It'd be a good, good motivation for a mass killer, wouldn't it? However, he is bound if he's without compassion, without love, without conscience. This is the difference between somebody who's psychotic and somebody who's spiritually aware. The one who is spiritually aware acts from friendship, acts from compassion, acts from love, acts from wisdom, actually has a conscience. The psychotically deranged has bypassed his conscience and in doing so has given up his humanity. So spiritually we are not the doer. But when we act on a social level, we take responsibility for all our actions. We very much are the doer. When we act in accordance with our conscience, we are the doer. Spiritually, we are not the doer. In terms of our spiritual realization, there is no I to be doing anything. Hence, abandon the wrong notions of this I am and this is mine. It is only because of these wrong notions that you think I am destroyed and suffer. It is only the egotistic and ignorant person who thinks I do this. Whereas all this is done by the different aspects of the one self or infinite consciousness. And that's fine. From the point of view of self-inquiry, this is perfectly apparent. 
Let the eyes see, let the ears hear, let the skin feel, let the tongue taste. All this is sensation happening. Let it happen. Where is the I in all this? Even when the mind continues to entertain various notions, there is not which can be identified as I. When you inquire into the I, there is no I. Whereas all these factors are involved in an action, the I assumes doership and then suffers. The yogis perform action merely by their mind and senses for self-purification. In other words, they are not motivated by the ego sense. He who is polluted by the ego sense, whether he is a learned scholar or one superior even to that, he indeed is a wicked man. On the other hand, he who is free from the ego sense and from the sense of possession and who is equanimous in pleasure and pain, he is not bound whether he does what is approved or what is forbidden. And that's fine. That's fine when we apply it personally. But we do not use this as a justification for killing, which is what's about to happen. Hence, O Arjuna, your duty now as a warrior, though it involves violence, is proper and noble. It isn't. The war that Arjuna's fighting is a turf war. It's a war over kingdoms. It's not a righteous cause. Arjuna's eldest brother gambled away the kingdom in a dice game. And now he wants it back. Where's the righteousness in that? Where's the proper conduct in that? The thing is, what we have here is notion of social order. In traditional societies, this social order is seen as divinely sanctioned. No matter how corrupt it becomes, it still has to be maintained. Fortunately, we've moved beyond these times and we no longer regard social order as divinely sanctioned. We've had revolutionaries who can stand up and point out the corruption of these divinely sanctioned social orders. Unfortunately, Arjuna is not such a person. He allows his conscience to be overridden. He allows his humanity to be overridden and basically becomes only a fighting killing machine in the name of God and here we have it and it's even underlined here in my text by the translator the performance of action appropriate to you even if it is despicable and unrighteous is the best by its due performance become immortal here even if it is despicable and unrighteous even a fool's natural action is noble in his case. What about the fool who goes out and commits rape, sexual torture, mass murder? Is this the fool's dharma? Is this the rapist dharma? The paedophile's dharma? It's all despicable and unrighteous. And yet the social order is demanding that such actions are performed. Is this what we're getting here? 